Now, before we begin, I would just like to say I am referring to the DDR here as socialist, but I am actually quite critical as to whether or not it would constitute a socialist country. Not for the reasons you think, however, it's because there was never any revolution in the GDR to begin with. Largely, it was a factor of Soviet hegemony that enabled the growth of the separate economic system. So, in many ways, you might call it hegemonically socialist, but don't get me called out on that not-true-socialism card. Okay, let's begin. Hello, friends. I've been in several debates over the past few days regarding the legitimacy of socialism in the DPRK. I have revised many of my opinions on the DPRK, and I am making this video to set some things straight and explain some very important concepts. When I'm asked whether or not I believe the DPRK is socialist, my very very short and simplified answer is yes. However, my answer at any greater length is that it is simply far more complicated than that. At the end of World War II, when the Soviets had liberated Eastern Europe from Nazi occupation, they had established a socialist camp in the world. Gone were the days of the USSR being the sole socialist power in the world. Now it had allies. But not all these allies were products of their own internal struggle. They were largely a product of a large socialist military and geopolitical hegemon, the USSR. For some of these allies, their status as socialist economies did not come through the class struggle. Their manufactured, synthetic socialism came through being a reflection of the organically socialist economy of the Soviet Union, with slight variations to match up the immediate conditions of the country. In 1947, the Bulgarian Communist Party, in a joint effort with Soviet jurists, drafted the second ever Bulgarian constitution, which would be modeled after the 1936 Soviet constitution. In 1945, the Romanian People's Republic and the USSR created Sovroms, which were jointly controlled Soviet and Romanian companies organized under Soviet administration. No one is arguing, however, that these countries were not socialist. No one is arguing that the People's Republic of Bulgaria wasn't socialist, or that the Romanian People's Republic wasn't socialist. Even though these countries did not produce their socialism organically, we still very much consider them to be socialist because their economies were organized off of the Soviet model and with help of Soviet administration. Now we must ask ourselves, did the DPRK come about under similar conditions and was its economy similarly built up as a reflection of the Soviet economy? In my last video we had established that the PRK was developed organically by the Korean people. However, there was hardly an assemblance of a socialist economy in the PRK. What was done economically in the PRK was what you'd see in typical national liberation struggles, with the expropriation of land held by the occupiers and the redistribution of land to the peasants. When the country was split in half and the PRK was transformed into the DPRK, its economy was developed mostly by Soviet investment and passively began transitioning into a reflection of the Soviet economy. This is actually still observable with the Tay and work system being based off of a refinement of agricultural techniques which were developed in the country from Soviet organizational aid which only changed in a manner which would combat bureaucratism. Socialism in North Korea, just as socialism in the Bulgarian People's Republic and Romanian People's Republic, was established by Soviet economists and Soviet advisors. Now the only question is whether or not the Juche idea can maintain this reflection. So why didn't the DPRK also fall when the Eastern Bloc fell? Make no mistake, the DPRK was absolutely a victim of Soviet social imperialism. When the Soviet Union dissolved, the DPRK immediately fell into a mass famine due to the oil trade being cut to the country. They were dependent upon the USSR to keep their economy running. The main reason that the North Korean economic model didn't change after Khrushchev's ascendance to power was that the DPRK was never an integrated member of the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, also known as Comicon. North Korea is not actually unique in this case. Another synthetically socialist country, Albania, remained on a socialist path after the liberalization of the Soviet economy due to it also not being a member of the Mutual Economic Assistance Council. Khrushchev had tightened Soviet control of the Eastern Bloc countries to the point where, when the USSR was liberalized, the rest of the Comic-Con countries followed suit. 
North Korea and Albania, with no demands being forcible upon them, were able to strike an independent path, although North Korea would remain dependent upon the Soviet Union until its dissolution. That really highlights a problem that the DPRK faces though. It's not self-sustainable. It simply does not have the personal access to the resources required of a modern industrial country to be self-sustaining. It needs trade to survive. Now the DPRK is dependent upon China, who, although politically not treating North Korea like one of its African neo-colonies, their economic relationship is practically the same. The DPRK does regular trade with at least eight different countries, with China alone making up 57% of its imports. It should be mentioned that, due to international sanctions, the DPRK relies upon the Chinese to act as a port to ship out DPRK exports. China receives very little back in materials, however. Keeping North Korea friendly with them is crucial in keeping NATO-aligned South Korea and Japan ever more distant. Now, as was pointed out in the debates, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem if China was socialist. However, we know it's not, and it uses trade to simply further its own economic interests. Another critique which was made of the DPRK was its militarism. But have they not been justified in this endeavor? Did Mao not speak of mimicking the aggressiveness of Chiang Kai-shek in order to adequately oppose him? Is the South Korean policy of universal conscription for all men ages 18 to 28, which they have been conducting since 1957, not a sufficient enough immediate threat to warrant a large armed forces? Is the nearly constant threat of invasion not a clear reason to try and instill trust from the masses in your armed forces? Most of the criticisms directed against the DPRK in terms of militarism were reduced to an idealistic notion that the Korean state could simply do without. We of course need to be critical of institutional militarism, but the conditions for a strong, united military force are still in place in the North. This is all without mention of the nuance regarding the difference between the KPA and the Worker Peasant Red Guards, the DPRK's paramilitary civilian defense force. As a principle, the military needs to have faith in the people just as much as the people need to have faith in their armed forces. The last argument worth mentioning is that Supposedly, a consumer culture is growing within the DPRK, as evidenced by the establishment of many restaurants, cafes, food carts that oftentimes seek to emulate Western brands. Now, this isn't entirely false. Under the current five-year plan, the North Korean government is trying to increase the level of goods and services present in the economy. This is part of the new goal for Pyongyang, also known as Parallel Development, in which they spend the bulk of their funding, not only now on the military, but also on the development of consumer goods. Not only will the people of the DPRK have guns, but they will also have butter, cars, and the like, as Kim Jong-un puts it. This is one of the ways we can clearly see that the sung Young military first policy of politics is being dismantled, as sung Young was never supposed to last forever and was only supposed to last until the DPRK had a sufficient means to defend itself otherwise, which it has achieved through its nuclear program. While the sum of consumer goods is expanding, it would be wrong to call this the birth of a consumer culture, as because there is an explosion of consumer goods, you're going to inevitably have an explosion of purchases. This is not indicative of a consumer culture. Should a wide expansion of consumer goods be considered the death of socialism? No, of course not. And as a matter of fact, such an expansion of consumer goods was the intention of the third five-year plan of the Soviet Union before it got derailed for the need of military buildup. To anyone who took part in those debates, and believe I skipped over something important, I probably answered it in the debates themselves, or conceded the point. Before I end this video, I'd like to give my own personal opinion on synthetic socialism. I don't like it. As a matter of fact, I'd go as far to say I dislike it. It's a very vulgar process. In my own personal opinion, socialist countries need to be left to develop their own economy and their own organizational processes so that they can ensure self-sustainability and ensure that their post-capitalist societies are a reflection of their own national history, their culture, and their conditions, rather than the conditions of some other country. In conclusion, the DPRK is a socialist state due to it being engineered as a reflection of the organically socialist economy of the Soviet Union. 
Not unlike other synthetically socialist economies of the time, the DPRK was under the social imperialist influence of the USSR, but did not have its economic model forcibly changed due to it not being a member of Comic-Con like Albania. Again, it finds itself within the sphere of another social imperialist power, China. But once again, not pressured into shifting its economic model due to the widespread support for the socialist economic model by the population, and China needing to maintain good relations with it, at least on the surface level. I'd like to thank my Patreons, Anderson Hansen, Antivirus Perspective, Austrian Maoist One, Calliope, Comrade Dodo, Fabian Freiberg, John Alexander Michael Bernstein, Jonathan Chavez, Kimo Vasala, Marcel Schachner, Mausov, Piggy, Diana Sidel Beard, and TTAM. If you would like to support me on Patreon, that would be extremely helpful as it is my primary source of income. Thank you.